This is just a sample of the audiobook. To get the complete audiobook access the link posted in the first comment. After dawn. Over the years, the Kennedy assassination has receded into mythology and has become like the tales of the Old West and the lives of secular saints such as Washington and Lincoln, fair game for the fabulist, the moralist, and the entertainer. Libraries have been filled with books offering vying theories. Some have been in support of the W.C., some indignantly opposed. All postulate with passionate certainty the righteousness of their cause. To be sure, some treatises rise to the level of admirable scholarship. The most outstanding and valuable of these are narrations by the authors who actually played a significant role in the historical events. Dr. Charles Crenshaw, a renowned surgeon with an acclaimed expertise in treating trauma victims, attended to President Kennedy in the emergency room inside Parkland Memorial Hospital just moments after the fatal bullets blasted through the President's head, causing his death. J.F.K. has been shot recounts in vivid detail those tempestuous, spell-binding, percipient, first-hand observations, analyses, and medical procedures undertaken to try and save Kennedy's life. Dr. Crenshaw documented these events with a medical precision that memorialized an evidentiary foundation, revealing tracks of bullets' entries and exits passing into and out of Kennedy's body and the condition of Kennedy's head wounds. Dr. Crenshaw's participation inside Trauma Room 1 made him an important witness in the truth-finding process. Yet this doctor and some of his colleagues who offered emergency care to the President and whose observations were corroborated and memorialized in writings and diagrams were never called to give testimony to the W.C. In his book, Dr. Crenshaw informs us as to the testimony and substance that he would have tendered. Most notably, based upon his expert findings, were his conclusions that the fatal shots which killed Kennedy entered the President's head and body from the geographical right and front area, the grassy knoll, and not from the rear, the Texas School Book Depository Building. Certainly, Dr. Crenshaw's expert testimony would have put into question the W.C. findings by contradicting its central theme that Oswald shot the president from the rear as the motorcade passed the depository building. This extraordinary W.C. omission and failure to chronicle accurately the assassination events appears in other relevant areas as well. In so doing, the W.C. created a fog of deception that has substantially called into question its authenticity and credibility. Why would the Commission not call Dr. Crenshaw, a highly credible expert whose opinions were invaluable in its alleged search for truth? And why did the Commission ignore trustworthy evidence and render conclusions to buttress a false narrative? Certainly, if the W.C. was engaged in a virtuous search for truth, then there was no rational reason to omit Dr. Crenshaw and his corroborating evidence from the official record. However, if the W.C. was a facade devoid of investigative legitimacy designed to tailor its faux investigation to a predetermined conclusion, then one readily accepts the reality of its deception. The people expected a straightforward, fact-finding foray leading to historical truth. Instead, it was given a Lewis Carroll through-the-looking-glass fantasy form of due process. First the sentence, then the trial, and if the accused is thereafter found not guilty, all the better, says the Queen. In early 1977, I was Deputy Chief Counsel to the Congressional Committee investigation into the assassination of President Kennedy. During the course of my probe, I came into possession of a memo dated November 23, 1963, from J. Edgar Hoover, to all Bureau Supervisory Personnel. It stated, inter alia in substance, that the FBI agents who had questioned Lee Harvey Oswald for approximately 17 hours immediately after Oswald's arrest had listened to a taped conversation between an individual who identified himself as Lee Oswald and an individual in the Cuban Embassy. 
The conversation originated inside the Russian embassy in Mexico City by this faux Oswald, who telephoned the Cuban embassy. The call was made on or about...